So this is the brand new Lumix Leica 100 to 400 Mark II. It's f4 to f6.3 for micro four thirds. It's so, so similar to the original. I actually thought that I was sent the wrong lens. The only difference is on the aesthetic side is that this has a zoom limit switch. Physical attributes aside, there's a lot of new stuff going on internally in this lens. And I've just come back from two weeks in Kenya on safari and I've really put this lens through its paces. So let me tell you all about it. One of the main benefits of the new version is it's now compatible with the teleconverters from Lumix. So they have a 1.4 times teleconverter and also a two times teleconverter. I went with the two times teleconverter because I thought bigger is better and I have some thoughts and feelings on that but I'll talk about the lens first. So what's new? First of all it's a very minor thing but it's actually a running joke in the micro four thirds community just how stiff the zoom ring on this lens, the original lens, is. It does have a lock and an unlock dial that you can twist, but even when it's fully unlocked, this original lens has been notoriously stiff to operate. And it can take weeks and weeks, if not months, to wear it in. Now I've had my Mark I for several years now and it's absolutely fine in that respect. But I did get a head start as it was used to begin with. <laughs> I'm very happy to say that Lumix have addressed this on the new version and it is very, very smooth to operate. That's the limiting switch that I keep forgetting about. Otherwise, very, very smooth to operate and you can still lock it down just like you could on the original. So the main benefit of this lens, whether you're looking at the Mark 1 or the Mark 2, is the versatility and the form factor. I mean, the size of it is crazy. It's exactly the same size as my full frame 70 to 200 lens, which is very, very portable and usable. And this is up to 800 millimeters in full frame terms. And even 600 mil in full frame is just stupidly massive. Here's one I made earlier. Here is the delightful 60 to 600 Sigma on the S5 Mark II. Let me tell you, as delightful as that lens is, and it really blooming is, a full seven hours on a game drive when you're on safari, you would be praying for something of this size. Because when you are out and about in safari, there's not always a place to lean. There's not always a place where you could be comfortable. Sometimes you're stood up and you're hanging out of the vehicle. You've got to be adaptable. And having these smaller lenses, smaller lenses comparatively with me was worth its weight in gold. And in terms of weight, it's just 985 grams, which is crazy. And both versions are also dust and scratch and freeze and weather sealed. They're both weather sealed. <laughs> Let me tell you the dust proofing on this. Both of these you'll see in my dusty b-roll. I haven't quite cleaned them yet after safari and it's still pretty dusty so apologies for that. <laughs> but everything has worked absolutely fine so the weather sealing is top notch. Stabilisation. Both the Mark 1 and the Mark 2 are stabilised lenses, which will enable you to have dual stabilisation on your Lumix camera if it has IBIS. Even at sort of the most zoomed out it can be, the footage is very, very smooth. The benefit of this outside of video is when you're following an animal, you've not got the viewfinder bobbing about all over the place. And it's a very smooth and, and comfortable experience when you have the camera to your eye with this lens. So let's get down to the important differences between the two. The Mark II is said to have an improved focus motor for tracking whilst zooming. And that sounds like quite a niche sort of a thing, but I've come to understand just how blooming important this is because I've just been on safari. I promise I'll stop talking about my safari one day, but today is not that day. <laughs> Generally, when you are tracking birds, if you are shooting at sort of a full 400 mil, the chances of you getting the bird in focus at this length is very, very slim. So the way that you do it is you start wider, you find it in your viewfinder, and as you're tracking the bird, zoom in and worry about your framing. Now the focus motor improvements, according to Lumix, come at this point. So the focus motor will be able to lock focus as you're zooming and moving and keep the subject in frame and in focus. Now. <laughs> This is a notoriously impossible thing to sort of tangibly test. 
because I can't get the same bird going across the sky. Excuse me, can you just come back? I need to do it again <laughs> with the Mark 1. But I will say my hit rate when I was out and about shooting birds is incredibly high with this combo, which is the G9 Mark II and the 100 to 400. Image quality. Here are some shots from the Mark 1 and the Mark 2 on Safari. Both are very, very nice quality and both have the Leica branding, which means they have to have very high standards in order to earn that. Now I find these lenses plenty sharp, but when you are shooting at the 400mm end, I do think things soften up slightly. I think that's a payoff that I'm more than willing to pay because of the size and the weight and the versatility of the lens. There are sharper, less zoomed in super telephoto lenses on the market, but I think you would struggle to find something as versatile as this. I think that is sort of the compromise with this lens. It's incredibly portable. Even the Olympus 100 to 400 is significantly bigger than this one. So it's, as, it's about as portable as you can get. But look at these images. You can get very, very sharp results, even at 400 mil. So I would say the image quality improvements from the Mark 1 to the Mark 2 are relatively minor so far in my experience. But it was very, very good to begin with and they're only building upon that. So it's, it's a pretty good thing, you know, it's already pretty good. I just wanted to quickly show you a piece of software, which is also a Photoshop plugin or standalone called Retouch For Me. I use these for my wedding galleries and I use them for portraiture and I also use them for my thumbnails as well. Let me show you what they can do. So this image was taken by my very talented friend Rebecca Santo. She does lots of backdrop work and when she heard about backdrop cleaner, she was like, mm, I'm listening. So first of all, let's look at the backdrop. Bang. How cool is that in one click? But then let's also look at the beautiful model and particularly around her jaw. I think if I was editing this manually, that's where I would do some dodging and burning to get some definition. And how cool. So let's see what retouch for me can do and also clear up a little bit of my mad hair and things in the background, hopefully. And how cool is that? It's tidied up a lot of the background of my wayward hair. But yeah, in one click, I think that is much blooming nicer. Now, babies are, of course, very cute, but if you've ever photographed babies, you will know that they are also full of snot and little crumbs and little bits and bobs that you always have to like Photoshop. That's how clean and gorgeous that is in one blooming click. We got rid of all the baby goop. Look at the jaw definition. To do all of these retouching things individually would take up a full day, easily a full day. Whereas now I can just go and have a brew and let this do all that work for me. So if that's something that sounds like it could help you, definitely check out Retouch for me. I've left all the links in the description below and I have it on good authority that they are having a Halloween sale for the weekend after this video goes live. So definitely check that out if you're interested. And thanks to them once again for sponsoring this video. So let's talk about the teleconverters. Lumix have a 1.4 times teleconverter and a 2 times teleconverter. Now one thing to know with these is the autofocus and the animal recognition, the subject recognition, worked pretty much flawlessly whether it was on or off. I was really impressed with how snappy the autofocus was using the telephoto lenses. The other thing to bear in mind is it does also double your aperture effectively. So this lens starts to become an f10 to f13 sort of lens and that is quite a niche use case. On micro four thirds we do suffer from diffraction a little bit quicker than on a full frame counterpart so when you shoot a very narrow aperture there's a phenomenon called diffraction which can affect your image quality and make things a little bit softer and because we're working with a crop sensor to begin with that happens way sooner down the f-stop chain than it does elsewhere. So I would say when we're shooting at f13 and maybe even f10, diffraction does come into play within these images. Some of the images using a teleconverter have a little bit less contrast than without, and sometimes they're a little bit softer. They're certainly usable, and it's such a treat to be able to get effectively 1,600 millimeters out of something this big, like the teleconverter is like this much more. So. If you are really interested in 
the range and less so about getting absolutely pristine pin sharp images. I think the teleconverter, the two times teleconverter with this particular lens has its pros and cons. I wish I'd have gone with the 1.4 times teleconverter in retrospect because I think that would give me a lot more versatility in the zoom but it wouldn't have narrowed the aperture quite as much. And I think that would be the sweet spot. I would recommend if you are looking at this one, possibly get the 1.4 rather than two times. And if you were looking at the other compatible lens, which is the 200mm f2.8 prime lens, then you could probably easily get away with the two times teleconverter on that because the aperture is pretty good and generous to begin with. Now, the teleconverter actually connects to this lens and the internal optics of the lens move out of the way. It's kind of cool. So that's why this is compatible, but the Mark I won't ever be, unfortunately. It's a physical thing to attach the teleconverter to. I found the teleconverter to be super fun. There was just like this smug mode where, you know, nobody else could quite see an animal that was far away. And I was like, hold on, I've got it. Here you go. That's what's going on over there. It's an elephant in a swamp. <laughs> and you may be wondering why it's not on the table. That's because it is so small and so portable that I'm not quite sure where it is right now. <laughs> One thing the teleconverter was bloody brilliant for was shooting the moon. I think when you shoot the moon, you would have a narrower aperture anyway. And I was really happy with some of the sharp shots that I got with this combination. And another benefit of the teleconverter, the two times teleconverter in particular, is it gives you a full life size one times macro capability on the 100 to 400 Mark II specifically. And the 100 to 400 Mark II has a 0.5 times macro straight away. So that's an improvement on the original. You can get some really nice close up macro shots with this lens and the teleconverter basically makes it like a really cool macro setup because you, tend to add your own light in and shoot at narrower apertures anyway when you shoot macro. So the teleconverter really does play to that strength. So what do I think about the Mark II? I think if you have the Mark I already, you're already, you've already got a great lens. I wouldn't rush out to buy the new one. I think if, if you like the idea of having the teleconverter and the other benefits, maybe if you shoot a lot of birds in flight, you will definitely feel the benefit from the Mark II. I think if you own neither at the moment, I would definitely go for the more newer version because the better focus motor will inevitably help with the burst modes, having the macro capability and the versatility of the teleconverters. I think there's a lot of good stuff in the Mark II compared to the Mark I. But if I already own the Mark I, I would probably be pretty damn happy. So I love the image quality from these lenses, but there are sharper lenses on the market, but there is a payoff. The sharper lenses tend to be prime lenses, like the 200mm or maybe a 300mm prime lens. And having the versatility, particularly if you are shooting wildlife, to have such a wide focal range on these lenses, I think the weight, the versatility, I think it's a great overall package with more than enough image quality to go around. And I really do think if you like shooting animals, this is the lens to beat. It really is. Check out some other videos from my safari trip and here are some other videos about the 100 to 400 as well.